If everyone could sit down and make, we can make a start in a second. Hello, my name is uh, Lenny Shale and I'm going to be your chair for tonight. Uh, welcome to this evening's rally of Socialism 2022, the annual event that we in the Socialist Party organise to bring together hundreds of the best organised socialist class fighters to meet, to discuss, learn and be inspired by the ideas and programme necessary to struggle for any gain possible in the interests of the working class, but to also build a party fighting to fundamentally change society along socialist lines. And that struggle is more relevant than ever. Three prime ministers, lies, secret parties, crony contracts, economic chaos, and a party in civil war. Welcome to the Tory party. Yes, the boss's traditional party government, law, order, and stability. And the events of the last few years, on top of the hokey cokey, yet in, out, in, out, circus act that the Tory party has become, would be too funny, really, if it wasn't for the devastating, worsening conditions for the working class faces across Britain and across the world today. And now we have Rich List Rishi, been working on that one. With 730 million in his back pocket, fully prepped and prepared by the bond market, bond holders and markets to tell us to prepare for more austerity, more suffering of the, and the attacks that we've had for the last uh, 12 years. But with every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The Tory and capitalist crisis and chaos has raised in the minds of working people across Britain that things need to change. The false idea that there are supposed norms, that things will never change, they've been blown away. 2022 will go down in history as the year the working class in Britain put mass strike action back on the agenda. The strike... <laughs> the strikes, both national and powerful local strikes, like the heroic Cobbin workers who were out for seven months have inspired millions. They have given a glimpse of the potential power of the working class and has demonstrated to a whole new generation who really keeps society running. They've seen that when a CEO or in the gaffers don't show up to work, who notices? But when your railway staff, train drivers, postal workers, telecommunication workers or bin workers go on strike, society comes to a stop. It's why the Socialist Party is fighting for mass national coordinated action to all strike together. But in the face of mass workers' action and against the background of disastrous economic and social crisis, the Tory party is in a state of civil war and disintegration. They could be brought down at any moment and a general election is on the cards. But who trusts Starmer's labour? Workers need a voice at the ballot box and a vehicle to, to struggle at the ballot box as well. And that's why building a political voice for the working class is a key theme of this weekend. But it isn't just Britain that's wracked by chaos. You can stick a pin on a map anywhere in the world and not find anywhere where there's stability for capitalism. Revolutionary movements have erupted in Sri Lanka an ouster president, and we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Iranian women, youth and workers have taken to the streets, and the US working class has begun to organise and mobilise with union drives and strike waves like no other it's seen in the recent uh, past. And that's just to name a few examples. But that, that fighting force needs to be organised and armed with socialist ideas to prepare it to take on the bosses and to also fundamentally change society, to take ownership of the vast wealth accumulated by the bosses and capitalist class, and to plan society, industry, and the economy in the interests of the working class majority, wiping out the plague, horrors, and suffering inflicted by capitalism across the world. This rally, this whole weekend, 
is about offering that lead, saying what needs to be said, doing what needs to be done, steering a course, standing firm, daring to fight against all pressures and obstacles. It's what makes the Socialist Party and the Committee for a Workers International that we are part of, it's what makes us different. We are confident in the potential power of the working class to act, to not just win pay rises, but to organise to change society. And we have a fantastic line of speakers tonight to show you why we are as confident as ever and why you should be as well. So to kick us off tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce, against the backdrop of last week's announcement that nurses in the NHS have voted to strike, nurse, Socialist Party member, and a leading NHS activist helping to lead the fight to save it from privatisation and destruction by blue and red Tories, Holly Johnston from Sheffield. Thank you. So nurses and support workers of the RCN are now joining our colleagues in the CWU, RMT, UCU, PCS and FBU and more in strike action. And close to one million NHS workers have been balloted across the health unions representing NHS staff across the board, including porters, admin, cleaners, support workers, nurses and more, with results to follow at the end of the month. These strikes are of historic scale and of massive significance in the NHS. The RCN are taking its first UK-wide strike in its 104-year history. Many staff have taken confidence that they are not on their own, see, see, seeing strikes in the, rail, on, in the mail and so on. And we send solidarity to all workers taking action and to all in struggle. The value of NHS workers and all workers was clear during the pandemic. However, the claps from the government were meaningless when the working class have faced attack after attack on our jobs, our conditions, our homes, our services and more, which is why we are organising in the NHS like never before. I've been a nurse for 18 years and there's never been a more crucial time for the NHS, its staff and its users. Striking for us is absolutely about pay. After years of deliberate pay erosion, 27% of trusts have food banks for staff, but it's also about the safety of our patients and about privatisation. It's about stopping the excuses that are being made to bring in private companies and outsource staff. It's about putting funding directly into recruiting and retaining staff and ensuring we have a fully staffed workforce to get through the 7.1 million uh, on waiting lists and it's about giving our patients the best care we can. Now the NHS was founded on, on a socialist basis and we need to be present with our programme fighting for a socialist NHS as we see the health of our nation suffering, inequalities increasing and the gap between the rich and the poor widening because there really is no other representation relevant to the working class and one that would safeguard the future of our NHS. Steve Barclay, the Health Secretary, again, said he was saddened by the proposed industrial action by the RCN, which he said was in nobody's best interests. What isn't in everybody's interest is the end of free universal health care and not looking after the staff that look after us. <laughs> Wes Streeting, a Shadow Health Secretary, is not going to defend the NHS. He's openly said we need the private sector to help uh, reform the NHS and he refuses to back our calls for above inflation pay rises. So we know health workers and the rest of society cannot rely on putting the NHS in the hands of the Labour Party. We need to kick out the profiteers, the privateers and re-nationalise the NHS for the benefit of all of society. <laughs> which takes our fight into fighting for a new mass workers' party and the need for a de democratic workers' control and to get rid of capitalism altogether.
The government and the media have been attacking us for strike action, but the reality is we have public support. NHS workers do not make the decision lightly, but we know things will just get worse and more and more staff are seeing it as their responsibility. We have seen what's been growing over the last year and it's showing us that the working class are fighting together and we need to keep going by pushing for coordinating our strikes in the health unions and across all sectors and organise for a general strike to force the Tories out altogether. Thank you and solidarity. <laughs> Thank you, Holly, uh, for a fantastic kickoff uh, to this rally. Up next is someone who hasn't stopped, I think, for a second in the last few months from addressing mass meetings, picket lines, and gate meetings of postal workers across Scotland. Gary Clark from Socialist Party Scotland, the sister party of the Socialist Party uh, in Scotland, is branch secretary of CWU Scotland Number Two branch, one of the largest uh, postal worker branches in the CWU. Speaking in a personal capacity, Gary has been a fighting voice in the CWU for many years for workers desperate to take action against bullying bosses in Royal Mail and to transform the CWU into a more fighting militant uh, force. But he's also been a, a voice and a fighting force alongside other Socialist Party members in the CWU, struggling to give CWU members, CWU members a voice at the ballot box and a, polit a political voice as well, to break the union's failed continuing support to the Labour Party. Uh, it, and, uh, yeah, whatever it's anti-worker actions, it, it, it does. Gary Clark, everyone. Thank you. Comrades, brothers and sisters, I'm standing here tonight proudly to speak to Socialism 2022. The last time I was here was 2019. I spoke at a rally similar to this in London almost exactly three years ago when I said we were about to take strike action, roar up to Christmas and we'll go hold raw mail to account. The following day, the Daily Mail put an article about me which well, as a socialist, if the Daily Mail attacks you, you know you're doing something right. <laughs> and also in the article, we had to Tory ministers naming me, Tory MPs naming me, and things like the big bag, bag bo bogeyman for Christmas that year. But I was quite proud of that. But this time, I don't stand here as somebody saying we're going to go and strike. I stand here as a striking postman who's been on strike for eight days already this year. <laughs> This is on the back of the pandemic, and postal workers, like many workers, stood up and worked through the pandemic, which we should have took strike action prior to that, but I'll leave that aside for a second. When you think about the public service we provide, and the public service they're attacking, we deliver to 35 million houses six days a week. If it wasn't for postal workers delivering to 35 million houses six days a week, who do you think was going to deliver the test kits during the pandemic? Who's going to collect the test kits during the pandemic? It was postal workers went out, got the test kits, and stood up and that. And we were applauded for that. But during that time, what happened when we were getting applauded like other workers? Royal Mail made a profit of £1.7 billion in the three years. £1.7 billion, think about that. And what's happened since then? We managed to get a national agreement, the pathway to change. We sat down. We got rid of Rico back, who, we, we, who was attacking us. We fought Rico back. We forced, um, we got Rico back the sack. Wasn't it Royal Mail? It was the CW members who got Rico back out the door. We then got a new CEO came in, Simon Thompson. And we said at the time, I, when, when other people said, well, Simon Thompson's a breath of fresh air, a new type of CEO. Us in the Socialist Party said, no, he's a CEO. He's there to represent big business, no representing interests in what ordinary workers. So we're now in the worst dispute 
a four, not even the worst dispute, is trade union movement in the Royal Mail. A 400 years of Royal Mail were in the biggest dispute in 400 years. In 1971, Royal Mail workers went on strike for seven, seven weeks. I would argue this is the most vital dispute. This is a dispute the life and blood of our members. We us deliver a public service which members deserve and workers deserve to get. So we've already said two can strike on eight consecutive days this year. Of that, postal workers do not get any strike pay. When you hear bill members get strike pay. Our members don't get a penny when we went on strike. We've took eight days of strike action already. And this week we have announced, you may have seen it already, lots of strike action. On the 24th, the 25th, the 30th of November, the 1st of December, the 9th of December, the 11th of December, the 14th of December, the 15th of December, the 24th of December, and Christmas Eve. <laughs> and you've seen this week, Royal Mail at their, uh, ex their board for six months profit warnings and that, announced they lost £219 million. But let's look at this for a second. Since privatisation, 2013, £403 million in profit. 2014, £486 million in profit. 2016, £551 million in profit. 2017, £575 million in profit. 2018, £581 million in profit. 2019, £411 million in profit. 2020, 325 million pound in profit. 2021, 702 million pound profit. And last year, 758 million pound in profit. If you do your quick calculations, that's over five billion pounds since privatization. Five billion pounds which could be there to provide better services for the public if it's also under nationalization and better wages in terms of addition for members. So don't come to me running and saying you're losing money, £219 million, when this year alone they've given the shareholders and the directors £600 million. You've actually brought in agency staff to work at a higher cost to stop our members making money. You've actually given Unite members a redundancy payment a lot higher than us. And what do they want to do to us? They want to, make, they want to cut 10,000 jobs. We've got a national agreement on actual redundancy payment, which can give us our members actually up to two years' wages. They're now saying that's now gone. You'll get nine months' wages. And they'll be saying on Monday, people running up to sign up for this, Gary. Yes, they are, because the way they're being treated in raw mail, not because things are a good deal, it's because they want out of the business because the conditions we are members are put through day in, day out. I say it's a very fluid situation. And things are happening today, I'm going to touch on very briefly. As I said, we had, we had meetings with them last week when they've attacked our sick pay, attacked our redundancy payment, they've attacked the flexibility worker, attacking the conditions life right centre. We had talks with me, but as member, these eight days of strike action, they weren't talking to at all. That brought them round the table. They said eight days of strike action cost them £100 million. Well, that's £100 million at your fault because you've been attacking our members' terms and conditions. So, as I say, it's a very fluid situation. The measures I've got today, there was a meeting this morning where ACAS facilitated that, where Royal Mail put a new offer to, to our, uh, our negotiating team. And they've said they've gave us to 5 p.m. on Monday to accept us. They have 12 talks on Monday morning. They gave us to 5 p.m. to accept us because they've called a board meeting in Royal Mail on Monday, morning, on Monday at 5 p.m. Well, they've called a board meeting. We have called meetings to our members at 5.30 p.m. on Facebook to get us up for the battle. And a gate meeting day on next Tuesday when hundreds, thousands upon thousands of CW members will be raising their hands and saying, we have no faith in the CEO and as a vote, no confidence in the CEO. I'll finish up here. They talk about saving money. They'll give, when you imagine this, a company which owns GLS, which is an international company, which Royal Mail own. So they give money to Parse Wars, uh, uh, work to Parse Wars, they give money to Ever Hermes. 
Why would a company give money to the give workload to the opposition when, when they say they're running out of money? Why would that? Because they want to break us. They want to make us worse terms and conditions. I'll tell you this now. Here's we'll put a line in the sand. You come to us with a decent offer, negotiate with us. We are not falling for, for your ideas and your finances. We've proven how much money you have made. And what we'll also will come for, we will have decent public service, publicly owned. That's what we call for renationalisation of Royal Mail. But also removal of the board, let people run the business who know the business, the workers. Cheers, Gary. And I can guarantee, like we have done every morning, uh, noon and night, Socialist Party members will be out supporting postal workers in this very important stage of the dispute in the run-up uh, to Christmas. But, but continuing on the theme of the wave of national uh, strikes, our next speaker arrives in the midst of a crucial dispute on London transport that he's leading for the RMT. A dispute that for each day cost the bosses millions, millions of pounds across the city of London. Funny how they, know, they never want to share that with workers uh, when they're making that much uh, wealth. But of course, it's not the only dispute the RMT uh, is fighting. The national rail strike that has sent shivers down the spine of the ruling class. It's been a powerful demonstration alongside the tube strikes of the sheer importance and reliance society has and really the power of workers, and it inspired uh, millions. In the few days after, searches of, to how to join a union went up 500% after just the first day. And a recent powerful new yes vote to continue the strikes have sent another blow uh, to the bosses. Speaking in a personal capacity, uh, Jared Wood is the RMT London Regional Organiser, and it's a pleasure to have him speaking uh, tonight. Jared. Thanks. I'm, uh, I'm speaking in a personal capacity tonight, but I don't think there's anyone in the RMT that wouldn't agree with me that the government's isolation of the RMT for new anti-union laws is anything other than a badge of honour that every single RMT member should be wearing. We're facing the possibility of the absurd situation where we could have rail workers striking, compelled to run a minimum service level, specifically, as the bill says, to allow people to get to school and medical appointments, only for those people to get to their school or hospital and find it's on strike. <laughs> Quite clearly, it's not just the rail unions that should be fighting these new anti-union laws. Minimum service levels will be spread across the public sector if they manage to get them established on the railways. We need the TUC to step up. The TUC should be threatening general strike action in the event that these new laws are introduced. And should that not happen, then we need a coalition of the willing. We need those trade unions that are prepared to stand together to defy anti-union laws to do that. We shut down the National Railways in June. It was the first time in the memory of most RMT activists that we'd had a national rail strike on the same day as London Underground shutting down. The so-called offer the offer that's been made to our members on Network Rail, 4% pay rise, in return for a third of all maintenance jobs going and the smashing up of the grading, new inferior pay rates, different terms and conditions. In reality, of course, it's not an offer. It's not designed to be an offer that anyone can accept whatsoever. On London Underground, which I represent members on, we've taken five days of action six days if you're a member of station staff, and we have action on certain station areas again on the 25th of November. And what we're striking against is an attempt to smash up pay, 
in the future, the, the current the current ballot actually is is on pensions, is on uh, is on uh, terms and conditions, and he's on job numbers. But uh, but going forwards, we will also next year be facing uh, an attempt to uh, to engage us on pay as well. And we've taken those days of action uh, up to now. It all stems from uh, a manufactured financial crisis, as a matter of fact. It's entirely manufactured by the Mayor of London and the government who have come up with an agreement that London Underground should be self-funding. And compare that with any similar system around the world. The New York, uh, the New York subway, 47% of, uh, of their revenue is raised by fares. The Paris Metro, 30% of their revenue is raised by fares. On London Underground, we're expected to raise 100% of our operating funding through the fare box. It's utterly impossible. And the mayor has signed an agreement to go back to that arrangement after COVID from 2024. And as a result of that, we face what we're told is a one billion pound funding gap. Now, one billion pounds sounds like a lot of money, but when we go on strike, we're told we cost the city of London 100 million pounds a day. So that means every day when we come into work, we're generating 100 million pounds a day of value. We're creating billions of pounds a year in value for the London economy, yet the government and the mayor will not support calls for a £1 billion a year subsidy to wipe out the funding gap. And yet we see this year bank bonuses back to record levels in the City of London. Just four banks are going to pay out £1 billion each in bonuses to their best paid traders and executives. Four banks paying out a £1 billion each. Any one of those could clear the public transport funding deficit that, uh, that the Mayor of London has identified. The billionaires are quite happy to come to London and make their money in London, but they will not contribute to the public infrastructure that makes London the city where they can make their money. And in that way, it's really a microcosm. It's a microcosm of the political and economic situation facing workers right across Britain at the, at the current time. When, when we go to these negotiating meetings with London Underground, it's like some sort of demonic game of bingo with figures being thrown at you from all angles. We've got to cut 400 million here. We've lost 200 million there. Well, we recovered 100 million there, but then we lost 150. Hang, hang on, how much is it that you want to cut? This is the way these negotiating meetings go on. No real detail or insight, just, just figures thrown at us of money that they want to cut. And, uh, and so I suppose it's encouraged me to, uh, to, to, to take more of an interest in facts and figures around the place. And, you know, I think we, I think we need to be quite, uh, we, we, we need to, to challenge the basic economic assumptions that are being thrown at us. Why is it we can't afford social care, pensions, housing, wages today when we were able to in the past? The GDP per capita in pounds at, uh, at, 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 uh, at current prices is £30,000, just over £30,000 in Britain at the present time. In, in 2000, it was £25,000, 1990, 20, 1980, 15, 1970, 12. So we've got more money per head in current prices than we've ever had before. Okay, it's dipped a bit since 2008, it, it dropped a little bit. But, but still, we've got, more, we've got more money per person now than we had in any previous decade. And yet we're told we can't afford the basic things that make society work and make life possible for working class people. Why? The Chancellor tells us we've got a £55 billion funding gap. It's like the, it's like the billion pound funding gap on London Underground. Where does it come from? Who says we've got a fit? Well, obviously, Keir Starmer says it as well, but we'll come back to that. £55 billion funding gap. So I looked these figures up as well. They, they said, uh, they said well, you, can't, you can't get that sort of money just off the rich. We've got to, we've got to share that out. Share dividends last year, 97 billion. Profits, 139 billion. Wages, over 100,000 pounds. So that everyone can have 100 grand, then off, but wages on top of 100 grand to any individual, 157 billion. That's 393 billion pounds that I think you could call the income of the rich. So if you need to cut 55 billion over three years, which is what they're trying to do, that's 5% of profits, wages over 100 grand, and, the, uh, and share dividends each year for three years. There you go, job done. And you don't need to make any cuts. <laughs> but 
plainly, we need to do more than that. We don't just want to defend the situation as it is. But again, you know, where, where could we get that money from? Oh, I wonder. What about looking at the QE that's been uh, dished out into the, into the financial services industry since 2008? 75 billion a year, every year from 2008 to 2021, stuck into financial assets and the accounts of the rich. How about using some of that money? How about going to them and saying, actually, do you know what? We need some of that back. We can't really, we can't really allow you to just hang on to that. While people, while people go to food banks and go without pay rises. So it's absolutely no wonder that the trade union movement has stepped up and that, uh, and that we've seen a massive increase in industrial action. But we also need a political response. We need more than that. We need a changing system that addresses the use of wealth in society. Labour councils, what are they going to do in the face of this new onslaught on local authority funding? Are they going to stand up and fight? Unfortunately, it doesn't look like they are. Starmer, is he going to fight it? He won't even challenge the narrative. He goes along with the 55 million story. He goes along with the idea that workers have got to tighten their belts. We simply have to build an alternative. We had that debate in a forerunner to the RMT, the ASRS, in 1900, when we took the view that you could not rely on the Liberals and the Tories, you had to build a Labour Party. We are, it, it's difficult to build a new party, of course. We now need to go beyond what, uh, beyond what Labour's come. And, uh, and that, that's difficult. There's a credibility gap. You know, my regional council discussed the idea of calling on Jeremy Corbyn to oppose Sadiq Khan for the mayoralty of London before the last mayoral election. These are the discussions we've got to have. But we have to put the call out for political change, for a new socialist, trade union-based political party throughout the Labour movement, throughout the trade union movement. Don't just agree it here. Don't just leave this meeting saying, that was a good point. Every single one of us has to take that back into our trade unions, into the Labour movement, and argue to change the narrative, to fight for real change, to fight for a socialist future. Thank you, Jared. I think it's important then to note about the work the Socialist Party is currently undertaking with organising trade unions and socialist coalition meetings across the country, uh, raising the idea of 100 workers' candidates in the next uh, general election, and winning, which is winning huge support amongst railway workers, postal workers, and many of those workers uh, taking part in the current uh, strikes uh, across uh, the, the country. And we want to continue those even more so going forward after this event uh, and after uh, a Christmas. Now, our next speaker uh, needs no introduction to many uh, here, but I think it's very important to give those who may be attending socialism or new uh, to this sort of thing for the first time, to, to give them uh, a one. You see, the Socialist Party uh, isn't just a thing, a thing that came out uh, of thin air. While we fight to advance society along socialist lines, we also hold within our party and its members the memory of the working class, its lessons and its history. Our origins go back to those who first made a stand alongside Leon Trotsky within the communist parties across the world in the late uh, 1920s against Stalinism, against the rising bureaucracy within the Soviet uh, Union. After breaking to build new revolutionary organizations in the early 1930s, our predecessor organization stood firm against the opportunism and ultra-leftism of Stalinism that allowed fascism to grow in the 30s across uh, Europe, that continued to fight for the working class and its independence in the independence through World War II, organizing and leading strikes and protests while also fighting fascism, while others succumbed to national unity. In the decades after World War II, many of us lost confidence in the working class. They took a more easier, simpler uh, uh, route. Others, like our next speaker, stood firm and despite small forces, dedicated their lives to build an organization to carry on the genuine ideas and methods of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky. With handfuls of members scattered across the country, they launched and built around a newspaper called The Militant.
and built a revolutionary party that was to become known as the Militant Tendency, the Socialist Party's former name. They would terrify the ruling class as it grew to thousands of members, winning huge support amongst workers inside the Labour Party, when it was a mass party of workers, unlike today. Winning three militant supporting MPs, leading Liverpool City Council when it took on and won against Thatcher, building thousands of decent council homes, creating thousands of well-paid jobs and more, and ultimately brought down Thatcher and her hated poll tax and by, by leading a historic mass non-payment campaign. Peter Taff is now political secretary of the Socialist Party, but was general secretary of the Socialist Party for many decades, leading this party alongside many others over those years, but also through the more difficult periods of the 1990s and noughties, where defending the very basic ideas of socialism and the very idea of a socialist organisation and party was crucially needed to be ready and prepared for the period we are entering today. Peter Taff is our next speaker. Comrade Chairman and comrades, Lenny Shales was doing extremely well there. I thought he should have carried on. <laughs> and then maybe occupy my position in the Socialist Party. It's really great to be here tonight and to hear all the speeches, but particularly to experience the, the comrades who are here for the first time, have attended one or a couple of meetings, and have listened to the marvellous contributions that have been made, made today. How pleased I am to see so many who've made the decision to acquaint themselves more with the ideas of Marxism, of the great Leon Trotsky, and of all the fighters who've gone before, who fought on your behalf, on our behalf, in order to create a party that can carve out and create a different kind of organization that will solve the begin to solve the problems of the working class. I think this weekend is going to be a landmark in the development of our party. And I say that because there's no doubt, and it's been illustrated by the contributions that comrades have made, that open class warfare on behalf of the ruling class in Britain and worldwide is on the agenda. It's a naked promise that has been made for them, made by them. Anybody who's got doubts about this only has to read the internal bulletin, if you like, of the bourgeois, of the ruling class, the Financial Times. In an article yesterday, they make the very blunt point, Hunt paves the way for years of pain. You're not getting this from a Marxist. This is the promise that is being made by the representatives of the ruling class. And if we don't fight back, then that will be the future for generations who have yet to experience the kind of things that have been mentioned in this platform here today. There's no doubt that open class warfare is back on the agenda. And that's no exaggeration. And that's not from our part. That's from the part of the ruling class who've demonstrated their utter bankruptcy and are trying to take the price back out of the, the, the conditions and the, uh, the, the, the rights of the working class in this situation. The explosive situation today across the world is so sharp that in some ways, it's more brutal on behalf of the ruling class than what we've seen, what our generation has seen. And you will have no real future unless you are prepared to link up with your co-thinkers and with working people throughout the world to create an organization and a movement and a party that can first of all arm the working class with an understanding of what is taking place. 
Because what is the situation that we face today? It's not just a battle in this or that town. The contributions from this play, this platform today, has been marvelous. They've been marvelous contributions. There's no need to repeat it. You could take any comrades in this meeting hall today and they could tell you about the experience that they've had in their town, in their area, and they confront global recession. You can't put a pin in a, a, in, a, in a map of the world without touching on a country that's going through the agonies of attacks on the living standards of the working class. We have them on this platform here today. And in, those, in that situation, when we confronted in Liverpool and nationally many years ago, this situation, it was only to discuss and to examine what was taking place. We decided on the basis of that analysis that we then had to take action and prepare the forces for this. This is how we approached the battle in Liverpool in 1984-1987. We had far fewer than is in this meeting hall this evening, a handful of people, but we had an understanding. We had a program, we had a policy, we had the willpower on behalf of the working class and those who supported Militant that was a handful in that city and in other cities that supported our, our newspaper and our party. And we, got, we, 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 we gradually gained success, gained support, and we built a powerful movement that, let's repeat this, that defeated the, what the most powerful representative of the ruling class in Britain until then, and that was Thatcher. It wasn't the right wing of the Labour Party. It wasn't, unfortunately, the left. It was militant, militant tendency that defeated that government in the course of the poll tax battle and humble Thatcher. We organized general strikes that resonated throughout Britain. We didn't have resources. We didn't have enormous power in terms of members and so on. We had a small organization that became a larger organization that meshed with the movement of the working class, that gave an understanding to the working class and prepared the basis for the movement that we developed. And how marvelous it was to experience this lord of capitalism or a, or a ladyship of capitalism, Thatcher, coming to Liverpool and being forced to bend the knee to the leaders of the council and withdraw the, withdraw the poll tax. That was one of the greatest defeats of the ruling class in Britain by an organized movement. And it was done by this party. It was organized by this party of the small cog of a party connecting with a mass movement in the course of, of, prepare, of creating workers who were prepared to fight and go to the end against capitalism. How many of our comrades? How many of our comrades were jailed and told Thatcher to her, to, her, to her face that you will not win in this battle? How marvelous it was to stand in the streets of Liverpool when Thatcher was visiting, visiting another Tories and she was told to her face, you will not win this battle. And she didn't win the battle. They tried to cover it up, but we, we had numerous people who went to jail who were prepared to go to the end. In fact, we wouldn't have any comrades standing in public positions without that preparedness to go to the end. I say to you here today, that kind of willpower, armed with a clear program, will be necessary to defeat the plans of the ruling class against the working people of today. And we say, it won't just be in Britain. It's time for the working class to emulate the youth in the last period, who've got in an uproar against the system worldwide, for the unions to organize massive demonstrations, to strike together, to go on to the offensive in every way possible, urge workers in every workplace, big or small, to get unionized, 
get finding out about socialism, encourage mass action by those, especially Generation Z as it's called, struggling with even finding an affordable room, room to call home because of rocketing market, market, marketing events. This developing mass struggle will raise workers' hopes and implicitly raise all the big political questions, how to win political power. Everywhere where the system of private profit reiterated, reiterated constantly as the only way to get things done is coming apart at the seams. Under scrutiny, it's failing this generation and they're searching for the ideas of socialism, for the ideas of militants, because that's what the ideas of socialism represent, scientific socialism. Some want to tinker around the edges to, take, to make capitalism more humane, more humane and sensible, just as if you can. Others, like some young climate protesters, have adopted the very good solution, solution, uproot the system, a great slogan to start with. Some leading trade unionists have drawn up five clear demands we heard about it. Enough is enough, attracting thousands of workers coming into activity, uh, often for the first time. But unfortunately, the matter of exactly how to win these demands is left hanging in the air, at least up to now. Who would introduce nationalization? The Labour Party? The B team for the bosses? No chance. Not one section of the capitalist class anywhere in the world has found a way to ride the capitalist tiger. There's no way that can create a balanced economy to satisfy all layers of society. This is particularly illustrated in the USA. Trump boasted that he was going to emerge triumphant from the recent elections. But as we predicted, that plan has somewhat backfired with wins by Democrats and defeats of Trump election deniers. Ron DeSantos of Florida, often described as Trump with brains, now, appear, now appears as posing a challenge. Trump's big announcement this week about the presidential election in 2024 might yet be challenged by DeSantis. The Trump vote's so-called red Republican wave turned out more of a trickle. But Trump and the mini Trumps are not going away. Whereas some thought the overturning of Roe versus Wade on the right to access abortion was a done deal. On the contrary, it had the opposite effect. It motivated thousands of young people and women in general to turn out for the Democrats. They took it as good coin, the label that they put forward that they stood for ordinary working people. They weren't going to miss the opportunity, however, the workers who came out in the youth, they were not going to miss the opportunity to strike a blow against Trump and all those who think and act like him. The threat of a Trump victory was forcing workers to look for a different, more radical alternative. Given the state of the American society, it could lead workers firstly to criticize the inequities of capitalism and then not just take a general swing to the left but more toward radical alternative, including some seeking a socialist solution. Perhaps this is a minority of workers at the moment, but nonetheless, given the chronic state of society, it could lead to a mass awakening of American workers and a move on to the scene of history. It wouldn't be the first time that we've seen this. We've seen it in our lifetime. In fact, at every turn in the movement of the American workers, socialism and revolution has been on the agenda. In the 1930s, mass movements against the Vietnam War, which we witnessed and participated in, and consider the horrifying and unforgivable events in Russia and Ukraine. We predicted in the last period that the launching of this invasion of Ukraine could lead eventually to a mass uprising and the beginnings of a driving out of Putin and his Stalinist gangsters. The retreat from the Son in the last week could be the beginning of this process, which if completed would represent a mighty defeat of this thug Putin. These are just harbingers of what is to come. And you, those comrades who are in this meeting tonight, and many who are not here, which we hope you'll communicate the spirit of this meeting, 
can, can witness the, more, the marvelous movement of the, Ameri of the working class on a world scale. Look at the, the workers in Kherson. Look at the workers in the Ukraine. They're not gonna go back to capitalism with the mass unemployment and the rest of it. They will look for an improvement on what they had before. They had a planned economy, but one that was dominated by a privileged bureaucracy. Look at, look at, look at the world we, we've had it touched on on this platform in the course of this meeting to, to, today. We had, for instance, the references to Iran and the marvelous movement that's taking place. We have a comrade of ours from Sri Lanka, and this is a very famous comrade in our opinion. He's not known very well by people, but this is somebody who participated in the mass uprising in Sri Lanka that defeated the reactionary government there and actually swam in the president's swimming pool. During the uproarish events that took place. All of this is an indication. It's a harbinger. It's a, a sign of the coming waves, the massive waves of struggle that are going to take place. I only hope I'll live long enough to see that movement taking place. In order for that to be realized, We've got to recruit not just handfuls of people, they're marvelous, they're vital for the future, but we're in a situation now where hundreds, tens of hundreds, tens of thousands will be looking for an answer to this rotten system that offers mass unemployment, that offers nothing but a dead-end future for the youth, that offers misery for the old, and all the rest of the evils of capitalism. And you are the generation that can organize a force that can destroy this movement by convincing people, not by force, but by convincing people of the superior, superiority of socialism. This is our next big task in Britain. This Tory government, like its fellow capitalists worldwide, is based on exploitation of the working class and youth, super exploitation. Under the code of the crisis, they are trying to inflict Further defeats on the working class. The working class is fighting back, as shown by this meeting tonight, tonight and the reports of the strikes and the fight back that is taking place. The younger sections of the working class are unbowed by defeats. They will fight back whether you are there or not. But in the process, if they have a conscious leadership and a conscious force, it will, it will shorten the road of struggle and it will shorten the number of sacrifices as well. In the course of this movement, we need a combative program with clear ideas that capitalism offers no lasting solutions, only poverty, the cage of austerity. You've heard it from the horse's mouth in the Financial Times. Not one or two weeks or one or two years, but decades and years of suffering of poverty, decades of austerity, and the prospect of war. Isn't the prospect of the world today to somebody like me who had all the hopes, like my generation, that we could create a new and a just world? And, and yet we have poverty, the cage of austerity, and the remnants of the Stalinist bureaucracy in Eastern Europe, which will be eliminated from this planet by the younger generation. Above all, we need an organization for this program to materialize, which will gather together a powerful force to defeat the capitalist defensive and pose the question of socialist change. I repeat, Socialism 2022 is part of preparing such a force. Everyone has a part to play. Those who are here tonight and those who are not here, you have the potential and the ability in the collective force to come together. I will never forget when we conducted the, the struggle in Liverpool, in the poll tax, and in other battles as well, and we won many of them, and we lost some. And it's inevitable in a struggle that you'll lose some. Like for instance, it appears as though we've been forced back in some fields, even in this period today. But the best of the working class learns. 
We went from a handful of people in Liverpool. We had no more than probably 20. And some of them are still here. I don't know how. <laughs> they must have. It wasn't any secret potions. It was the ideas of Marxism and of Trotskyism and the, the lessons that that gave to us. Comrades, we have to look forward to a positive perspective for the working class and a positive perspective for the CWI, for militants, and to all our sections who are affiliated to the CWI. They are made up of some of the best fighters, some of the most self-sacrificing workers in Britain and internationally, but they are not alone. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, who don't yet know that they agree with us. We have to reach them, we have to convince them, we have to involve them with them, and we then have to build a force in Britain of tens of thousands not to be happy with what we've got. And then you, your generation, can build on that a mass force as we did in Liverpool in organizing the poll tax and in the battle the council struggled as well. We defeated Thatcher. Remember, you are not just Marxists or socialists. You're part of a party that defeated the strongest representative of capitalism that they've had in Margaret Thatcher herself. We humbled her and defeated her in the, in the city of Liverpool. And that was a portent. It was only interrupted by the, those people who betrayed the movement. That will be resumed again by your generation and the next generation. And in the course of that movement, we will inspire workers in other countries like we did in the past, and we will create the basis for the transformation of Britain into a socialist and democratic force. And that will go together with the United Socialist States of Europe and a World Socialist Federation. That's the aim. We, we don't meet here, here to pat ourselves on the back, to generate hot air. We, we, we meet here to organize a force that can conquer the political support of the working class and lay the basis for a similar process on a world scale to establish a socialist United States of Europe and a socialist confederation of the world. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, and Peter touched on uh, Liverpool there and the role militant and the Socialist Party, what, well, what, what the Socialist Party played there when we were called uh, militant. And Peter talked about the Financial Times being the bulletin of the ruling class. Another spoke, a voice uh, of the ruling class is the New Statesman magazine. And a number of years ago, well, few, only a few years ago, they made a comment about what militant the Socialist Party did in Liverpool. And they said, look, militant offered hope to those in need. Moribond local Labour Party swelled in numbers. Thousands took to the streets in support of the militant-controlled council's resistance to a conservative central government. Has there ever been any occasion when 50,000 people marched in support of a local council? Militants knew its base because its members were of that base. And that sums us up. I've mentioned a number of times, and Peter has, Peter did just then, that the Socialist Party is part of the Committee for a Workers' International, struggling for socialist change across the world and fighting to build more sister organisations across 
of the world. Our next speaker, Prasad, is a leading member of our sister party in Sri Lanka, United Socialist Party. Like the Socialist Party here, the history of Trotskyism and our sister organization in Sri Lanka has a tradition and legacy of huge struggles littered with lessons and much to learn from. The last year in Sri Lanka has seen the masses take to the scene of history. It has brought down a tyrant president and his gang of thugs who ruled the country in the recent period, and the potential for revolu more revolutionary events to develop and for the working class to lead the struggle forward is there to see. And the question of which way forward for the working class and the need for socialist ideas is crucial. Prasad, as well as being a leading member of our party in Sri Lanka, is a committee member of the Go Gotta Get Gotta Go Gamma campaign, which called the mass protest, which Peter touched upon on the 9th of July, which seized the presidential palace. And I'm sure many of us will remember the scenes of people seizing the palace, jumping in the swimming pool, enjoying some of the lavishes that the president uh, once uh, in, enjoyed. So it's a pleasure to bring him forward as our next speaker, uh, Prasad. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I want to first of all, I want to thank you, the Socialist Party and the CWI, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. You all must have seen on the 9th of July, uh, more than a million of people from all around the country uh, stormed the presidential palace and uh, some of the uh, main government buildings in Sri Lanka and forced the uh, then president Gotabe Rajapaksha out of the country. Origin of these protests uh, starts with the farmers and teachers struggles that started in 2021. Though, uh, the movement that started uh, on 9th of April, which actually forced the uh, Gotabe Rajapaksha out of the presidency, was uh, initially spearheaded by the middle class and the petty bourgeois. What initially gathered those masses was um, mainly lack of food, uh, fuel, and uh, the long electricity cuts that actually um, lasted more than uh, lasted more than uh, twelve hours a day. But the masses were uh, provoked further by the um, government attacking the protesters who have been protesting against the power cuts on 29th of March. It was uh, very clear at the beginning of the protest, the government did not take the uh, movement very seriously. They were actually teasing about it. But on the 6th of May, uh, Activists from the Gotago Gama, alongside with the trade unions and the political parties, they have managed to call off, for, called for a general strike, and that was that could have been done after uh, 1980, and uh, they have also called for a uh, hartal that was called all around the country. That has been done after 1953, and this both of these were very successful. Majority of the union supported the uh, general strike, and uh, all the roads were decorated with black flags. Major rallies were held in all the cities around the country. And um, then only uh, the government realized this Gota Gogama or the Aragalaya is not something they should take lightly. And on the 9th of 9th of May, uh, just after one month uh, of establishing Gotago Gama, uh, then Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksha called some of his most loyal followers from uh, his political party and uh, sent them uh, to the Gotago Gama to attack them and destroy them. Well, it was uh, there was not many people in the Gotago Gama at this mo at that moment and. Uh, 
it was a shock to most of the protesters. But uh, police was there, but they, they just allowed those uh, thugs to just come into the Gotagogama, attack all the protesters, and burn down their huts and uh, tents. Uh, this, all this event was broadcasted live on social media, and uh, after like 10, 15 minutes, thousands of people who was from around the um, around office, construction sites, and the harbor stormed into the uh, golf face green to defend the protesters from the attack. And um, not only, <laughs> not only um, in Colombo, around the country, thousands of people took, like, gathered whatever they can and uh, hit the street to attack ruling class politicians and their buildings. End of, the two, end of two, those two days, 20 plus houses and businesses that was belong to uh, ruling class politicians were burned down, and one uh, member of the parliament was killed um, after one of his bodyguards tried to shoot down protesters. Uh, this forced uh, Mahindra Rajapaksha to flee the flee his uh, mansion in Colombo, and he flee to an uh, isolated island in Trincomalee that is about 200 miles from the Colombo. And while he was there, he resigned. None of the uh, MPs from the parliament was willing to accept the prime minister position unless Gotabe Rajapaksha resigned from his presidency. But uh, Ranil Vikram Singh, a politician who has been there for like for long time. I mean, he was there since I was born, and and uh, he uh, he was uh, he has only one seat in the parliament, and uh, he's the only one who uh, accepted the presidency without uh, accepted the prime ministership without any conditions. And, uh, but th th this didn't change anything in the uh, ground situation. The prices were up, the fuel crisis was, uh, crisis was there, uh, the medicines were low, and everything remained the same. So on the 9th of July, uh, the Gotagogama uh, Action Committee, which I was part in, uh, decided to call for another mass gathering and uh, there was more than a million people showed up on that day. On that day, uh, government tried to stop people from attending by uh, st stopping all the uh, trains, buses, and uh, whatever they can do to like, stop uh, people from attending. But people took uh, whatever the vehicle they could find, they actually restarted the train service. and. Uh, Millions of people, more than a million people, gather, uh, came into Gotagogama, and uh, they have captured presidential palace, um, presidential secretariat, and uh, prime minister's house. And uh, Gotabi Rajapaksha has to flee the country. On the 13th of uh, July, uh, once more, people gathered to demand Gotabe Rajapaksha to resign. Even though he was leave, he left the country, he didn't resign from the presidency. On that day, people captured uh, uh, prime minister's office and they rallied in front of the parliament. But the thing was, people did not, uh, at that moment, there was no one have actual power in the country. And even uh, people, if, we, if people wanted to, they could have claimed it. But the movement was not ready to take power. Um, so uh, movement decided that we should allow Galav the parliament to uh, make a correct decision after the um, uh, president was resigned. But what they did was they elected the same prime minister who has no people's mandate as a president. As from the first day he came into power, he started to use full force of the uh, establishment to crush down the protesters. Uh, 
he is using all the all the laws in the uh, constitution and the law books to uh, suppress democratic rights. Whenever we try to uh, hit the road and start protest, there will be hundreds of police officers armed with uh, riot shield, armed with uh, water cannons. They will be present to crush the protest. And uh, two of the main student leaders who has uh, part of the um, Aragale movement has been labeled as terrorists and are detained for more than 90 days now. So we believe that, uh, but post this, why, why we couldn't actually achieve any lasting change from the movement was because it didn't had a clear political leadership, it didn't had a clear political vision, and it was not uh, started on a clear class base. So what we need, what we have to learn from the movement is if we want to achieve a lasting solution and lasting system change in the system change from any public movement, we need to have, a, we need to build that uh, movement based on clear class politics and it should have a proper leftist leadership when it progress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prasad, and I'm sure Prasad will be around uh, later tonight and tomorrow for anyone who wants to talk more, discuss more, and learn more about what's going on in Sri Lanka. And social students, I know, is going to be organising a, a speaking tour of both Prasad and other members discussing the events taking place in, in Sri Lanka and building up that solidarity uh, with our fellow socialists uh, in Sri Lanka uh, as well. And as you may have noticed, the Socialist Party has members supporting, members involved, members assisting, members leading, strikes, disputes, campaigns and struggles uh, across the country. Over the course of the last few months, I don't think there's been a week where there hasn't been several different bulletins, several leaflets produced to intervene and provide a, a steer of course in some of the struggles that are taking place. And our next speaker, Sheila Caffrey from Bristol, has two jobs uh, to tonight. As a member of the National uh, Executive Committee of the National Union of Teachers, speaking in a personal capacity, she's here to report on the work Socialist Party members within the Teachers Union and within education are doing to win and fight for coordinated action, to fight for national action uh, by teachers, to take on the attacks that they face within the union, but also some of the work we've done over the course of the last few years, fighting the interests of students and workers within education, particularly, particularly during the pandemic. But she's also here to tell you why, why and how you can donate to the socialist cause and help support our work for fighting for socialist ideas, both here in Britain and across uh, the world. So Kaushida, our next speaker. So it's always good at the start of your speech where you have to correct the person uh, who introduced you. I'm afraid I'm not a member of the National Union of Teachers that's not existed for several years now, but of the National Education Union, which is the largest education union in England and Wales, who actually organises not only teachers, but anyone who works in a school, nursery or college. And last month, the NEU's completed indicative ballots certainly showed that education staff have had enough. The majority of education staff are facing a 7% real terms pay cut on top of a decade of pay cuts and austerity slicing our public services and smashing our standards of living. 
And this includes our 40,000 support staff members, teaching assistants, cleaners, lunchtime staff, usually on part-time uh, pay and all on term time only contracts, who are then some of the lowest paid workers in our communities. But it's not just about pay. Education workers have faced cuts absolutely everywhere. In school budgets, library services, special educational needs support, English as an additional language support, nurture support. And then we're offered a measly pay rise that's so far below inflation, it's an insult. And then we're told, even with this utter pittance offered, that the government refuses to even fund it leaving cash-strapped schools with the choice. Pay staff so they can afford to heat and eat this winter or cut elsewhere. This is not a choice. And so education workers, who certainly don't work the 60 to 80 hours a week because of the pay, and do it all instead for the students that they support and teach, have said enough is enough. With a 62% turnout and an 86% yes vote for teachers, and a 68% turnout and a 78% yes vote for support staff. We're pushing ahead with our formal ballot, calling for a pay rise in line with inflation that is fully funded from the government. Yeah. But the road ahead to first win the ballot and then to win on pay and funding will be hard and long. Many members are resolute to win the pay rise they need and ensure that schools are funded properly. However, we will need to prepare for hurdles. We voted at our annual conference to take action on pay last year, but national officers stated that we'd never win a national ballot and ignored the instruction. But leaders need to be there to lead. If members aren't confident, a strong union leadership needs to build and motivate to ensure they win. And if leaders aren't confident, and if leaders aren't confident and willing to fight, then they need to stand aside for those who will. I'm part of the NEU's national executive, and as I am part around comrades tonight, I will admit that this was not the plan. I stood two years ago with the assurances from comrades that we'd use it to raise socialist ideas, but there was no chance that we would win. Which was great, as sitting in a room of paid and unpaid, power-hungry bureaucrats who have sat on action time and time again and prevented the union from becoming a national fighting force in education was my idea of absolute hell. But then the unthinkable happened and we won. Apparently, members like the call. <laughs> Thank you. Like you, apparently, members liked the call to lead from the front and build from below. They liked the sound of an active fighting union that would actually win on pay and workload. I mean, who knew? So. We now have five Socialist Party members, along with about seven other left-wing activists, who continually put forward the ideas of action on the national executive in this weird kind of echo chamber. So for a year, we, we've written motions, which they all vote against in the meeting. Then at the next meeting, they run our motion through a thesaurus, take out the words national strike action, and then vote it through. So our national conference this year came again and members voted to strike again. They were calmed and appeased, and nothing happened. Then the rail workers and the RMT came along. Then ASLA, then the CWU. Rank and file NEU members in every workplace started to stand up and demand action. And we, as the Socialist Party, stood with them clearly, saying that the government encourages a race to the bottom. But we know that a win for one is a win for all. Let's show the solidarity by going to others' picket lines, but then let's take our own action to achieve the win that we need to. And then the tops of the NEU moved. We had the indicative ballot smashing the anti-trade union thresholds. So we're now in the midst of our real ballot alongside the NAHT and the NASUWT, two other education unions. 
As a socialist group on the executive of union, we've pushed for a commitment to a series of actions that escalates if a government does not move on our pay. This move means that the union will not be doing their nice little grand old Duke of York where they march us up to the top of a hill for a one day protest but instead will publish a programme of action to show the government that members are serious about winning a fully funded pay rise. Now, of course, our motion was voted down last time, with one argument being that we weren't including enough action. So I'm looking forward to our next meeting next week to see what the thesaurus will do with our motion and what amount of action we'll be taking from February. So I am proud that my union is now standing up and fighting back. Proud that I'm going to be meeting fellow workers on picket lines. And all workers' pay, pensions and benefits must be increased in line with inflation, agreed by unions twice a year in times like this. We all know that if you fight, you can win. But this isn't about can. It's about must. But it's not just about fighting in the unions and workplaces. It's not just about education workers fighting for funding in schools. It's about the communities where we live and work too. I'm a teacher in the Bristol council estate, an area that has been battered for decades by the savagery of very few jobs, of poor pay, poor housing and government cuts. I teach a child whose mum kept at home twice last term as she couldn't afford a school dinner and hadn't any food left in the house for a packed lunch. The cleaner who cleans my area at school collapsed with an asthma attack on a Friday but was still back in on the Monday as she couldn't afford the time off and the privatised company she works for refused to pay sick pay without a doctor's note. The school is surrounded by blocks of flats which in the last month have been having flammable cladding replaced over five years after Grenfell. Ten families in my class live in a block of flats run by a private housing company, which even the local MP has condemned and said is unfit for children due to space and the drug dealing and knife crime in the car park outside. But there is nowhere else for them to go. This is how ordinary people live while profits for companies are through the roof with massive dividends to shareholders. What an absolutely damning indictment of the system that we live in. Now, of course, we do what we can as individuals to help. And rest assured, education workers support all the children in their classes with food, with clothing and other basic needs. But individual charity cannot be the answer. We need to demand a programme for change that will allow ordinary people to thrive and not just barely survive. We know health and safety, housing, heating and eating are basic needs and will be easy to provide for all. But they'll never just hand it to us. 22 months ago, education workers knew this. We used the law known as Section 44 to refuse to go into unsafe workplaces to ensure us, our pupils, our colleagues and our communities were kept safe and well in the midst of the pandemic. When the government refused to act to protect people above profits, workers realised their power and said no, saving thousands of lives. <laughs> the inequalities in our society are blatant. Fighting alongside the communities we live and work in, we need to make it clear. Keeping pay low is a political choice. Allowing fat cats and big business rein in obscene profits is a political choice. Let's make it clear that this is not our choice, that we reject this choice by building a socialist alternative so it becomes a large fighting force with workers hearing our message and joining us. And of course for that, we need socialist ideas and we've got those by the bucket load. We need loud, confident, socialist voices sharing the Socialist Party's programme, which has been clear we have this this evening, as well as in the sessions I attended today. And we need socialist finances, which we also need by the bucket load. We need to unite workplace fights with those struggling with day-to-day -day existence. We need to take these campaigns to our workmates and workplaces. And of course, we talk to our workplaces and workmates. But we also aim to visit every picket line, march on demos, intervene in rallies. And for these, we need to take leaflets, posters, placards, explaining our position, 
urging workers to join us and discuss with us. Time and time again, workers on picket lines and on demos know there's a solution and they're agreeing with what we're putting forward. But we live in a capitalist world and all this costs money. Two pounds for a single placard, 150 pounds for 2,500 leaflets and 200 pounds for two and a half thousand posters. Now, I saw the glances at the door and the running for the door as soon as money was mentioned. But this isn't my classroom, so I won't be accepting hands up to go to the toilet. I want hands up clutching the forms on your seats. Are you the person who wants to reach 2,000 people with leaflets to motivate and lay out a programme of what is needed to win? In which case, fill in 150 pounds. Are you the person who'd like to plaster the next national demo with key slogans and details of meetings on places? In which case, put down 200 pounds. Scan the QR code, write your check, or pay at the stall tomorrow. We've already got some coming in, so I'll start reading some of them out. We've got a donation of, it says at least so far, so I'm assuming it's going to be doubled by tomorrow, of 7,000 pounds from the southern and southeast region of the Socialist Party. Excellent, comrades. From Hackney and Islington branch, we've got £1,360. We've got an individual donation from Sally Griffiths from Manchester and Sulphur branch for £285. Now, comrades, I'm aware everyone's struggling financially. The cost of living crisis, borne by the Tories' greed, is being paid for by the working class. But we cannot change this if we don't fight back. We cannot change this if we don't push the unions and we don't have a socialist alternative. And one thing the Tories were right about is that there isn't a magical money tree for us. There is for them. They just squeeze us even harder. But for us, we have no big business backers. We just have the generosity and the sacrifice of the most militant class fighters. And I'm giving you time to show that you are they while you're filling in your forms. So, from the Sheffield branches, we have a donation of 720 pounds. Thank you, comrades. Camden and Haringey branch, £1,160. From Mark Davis et al, I don't know whether that means he's just very grand or whether there's a group of you. Uh, from Worcester, £1,550. Coventry branch, £7,650. From the uh, small but perfectly formed my own branch, Bristol North, £1,100. From the Birmingham branches, £800. From Plymouth, £3,760. And a donation in memory of Jane James, the comrade who sadly died, £500. Now we know, living in the capitalist world we do, that one person's pennies is another person's sacrifice. We have people here who only receive the state pension, who are on zero-hour contracts, who are students, school students, who don't currently have a job, and their donation is just as important. We're a movement and a party of the whole working class. So although these are very large donations, we also accept much smaller donations, as we understand that is a sacrifice for many people. From Andy and Mandy Bentley from Stoke, 200 pounds. From Andy and Hull, £30. From a student, Archie and Waltham Forest, £20. Uh, from a comrade in Germany, £60. 
And as many of you will have seen, that we are as part of an, uh, an international organization. It says on the back of the, the sheet that you all had, we are donating a third of this appeal tonight to our international comrades in the Committee for Workers International. So you can return home smug tonight that you are building world socialism. Swansea and West Wales, 1,125 pounds. Well done, comrades. Gloucestershire and Swindon branch, £2,000. Uh, Chesterfield, £265. Uh, Jamie Davis from Caffilly, £50. And uh, two comrades from Cardiff, Joanna and Till, £50. Now, as a teacher, just like Pavlov's dogs, I'm likely to keep talking until I hear a bell. So I could just keep going. But we have got more speakers to hear from, so I'm not going to read any more out. But don't feel that that means you can't carry on donating. Please keep putting in the buckets and passing in the slips. But do remember, coins jingle in buckets, so the more notes you line them with, the better we are to hear the speakers. So thank you very much, com comrades. Solidarity with all your struggles, and I look forward to seeing you all on the NEU school and college picket lines very soon. I'll be, speak a little slower while the buckets <coughs> are being uh, uh, passed around. Uh, thanks, Sheila. And don't worry, uh, I did, secretly I cut her time. Uh, but, I mean, first of all, I blame having teachers who are NUT reps for most of my life and having an NUT <laughs> membership card on my kitchen wall for most of my childhood. And um, people can donate as they're walking out. There'll be buckets. And after hearing some of the more speakers, you think you want to donate even more, don't worry, it's very easily done. <laughs> And there'll be uh, card readers outside as you leave if you want to pay by card. But also tomorrow morning uh, in the reception for your area where you were yesterday, there'll be a chance to pay in as well. But also if you're watching online, there should be a QR code on your screen. Yeah, we're high tech these days. Uh, where you should be able to scan and go direct to the link page on our website. But also go to socialistparty.org.uk forward slash S22, where you can pay online uh, there uh, as well. Now, it hasn't just been na the National Rail, Mail, and BT strikes <coughs> that have sent shockwaves for, for the ruling class in Britain in the last 18, month in the last <coughs> 18 months. Since the aftermath of the pandemic, Local action by both private and public sector workers striking for pay rises to keep up with inflation have exploded. Many have been of a, been of a completely changed character of the recent period. Strikes that have struck to win huge pay rises on paper when really, in reality, they're just keeping up with inflation and in many cases going all out in order to do so. The Unite the Union under the new leadership of Sharon Graham has been central to this development and behind strikes all over the country, demonstrating that if you strike, you can win. Just last week, after scheduling 51 days of strike action to start with, then upping it to all out, Birmingham Metro tram workers quickly forced the buses back down for a marvellous victory. And it comes on the heels of the Coventry Unite bin workers who went all out for seven months, as I mentioned earlier, until they won. So as a COV kid, it's fantastic to welcome our next speaker, one of the key leaders of that dispute alongside the heroic local uh, reps who's been up and down the country in the last uh, year or so, organizing and leading strikes to win. From Unite the Union, on Sab. Thank you, brothers, sisters, and comrades. Firstly, solidarity 
from Unite, the Un Unite the Union. Solidarity from Unite General Secretary Sharon Graham. And solidarity from our members involved in over 450 separate disputes over the past year. 80% of those resulting in victory. And solidarity, solidarity from the victorious Unite Liverpool Dockers. They stood strong, they refused to step back, and now they have won. Solidarity from our NHS members, balloting for strike action. And let me make this absolutely clear. The dispute is about saving the NHS itself. Yes, we are demanding better pay. That is absolutely linked to saving the NHS. Over 130,000 vacancies in the NHS in England alone. It is staffing shortages that cost lives. We have members working 18-hour shifts. The waiting list for non-urgent treatment is now over 7 million. And as usual, as usual, Keir Starmer gets it wrong. When asked about NHS pay, he said we need to get recruitment and retention sorted first of all and then pay later. Here's the news. It's the other way around. Nurses are leaving because they can't afford to live and work in the NHS. It's quite simple. It's quite simple, comrades. We demand fair pay for health workers with immediate effect. Solidarity, solidarity from our members of bus operators, Abellio, Metroline and London United, preparing to take strike action. Taking inspiration from our members of bus operators, Arriva, Stagecoach and Go Ahead, who have already taken strike action and already secured double digit pay wins. Brothers, sisters, brothers, sisters, comrades, there is a lot, there is much to be angry about. And there is sometimes the danger of becoming despondent. And you know what? We should be angry. Angry when nurses are forced to use food banks. Angry when parents dread school holidays because school is the only place where their children may get a hot meal. Angry. Angry when a two-year-old child dies because of the mould in his home. Angry when a child dies from an asthma attack caused by traffic outside her home in the South Circular in London. And all this in the sixth richest country in the world. But you know what? We must not uh, despair because there is a flame that is now burning. It is burning bright. It started with a flicker and now it's a roaring, raging flame. So never be despondent because not only are workers fighting back, but we are winning. Winning at Lerwick Port, where Unite members took strike action and won a pay deal, and it's not a misprint, a pay deal worth 38%. And, 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 here's the, uh, here's the bit I really like, because I can see the Coventry massive are in the audience uh, tonight. Winning at Coventry City Council, where our members took eight months of strike action, where a Labour Council, a Labour Council spent over four million on a strike breaking operation and lost, where a Labour Council attacked our Unite rep and lost. And while we are on, and while we are on the subject, while we're on the subject of Labour councillors, let me once again reiterate our position in Unite, a position Unite has in common with the Socialist Party. Politicians have choices. They do not have to make cuts. Labour councils, and here it comes, <laughs> Labour councils can choose to agree needs-based, no cuts, legal budgets. They can use reserves and borrowing to plug short-term gaps while joining with trade unions and communities to demand and win the necessary funding from central government. It can be done. The magnificent Liverpool councillors in the 80s did it. Poplar councils in London in the 1920s did it. It's a matter of choice along with guts and courage. And another thing, 
on Labour councillors, on all other politicians of cuts, big business and privatisation. They have failed workers. Our members can expect nothing from these politicians. That is why our members have taken matters into their own hands. In dispute after the dispute, our members rely on their own power. Our emphasis on winning in the workplace has proven by results to be correct. But we also know that while we will march, we will lobby, we will demonstrate, ultimately we need to build a movement, not a moment, and Unite will play its role in that. And while we sometimes, as I said earlier on, may feel despondent, the inspiration from our members, our NHS members at Guy's and St Thomas's, exhausted nurses, drained and shattered, and yet, and yet, protesting outside the hospital last Monday, not just for more pay, but to save the NHS. They make the choice to fight back. They have made the choice to be balloted for strike action. And this is what this is about choices. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt chose not to save the NHS. Hunt chose to protect profits. Unite Research has shown that the UK's biggest listed companies boosted profit margins by 73% in 2021 compared to before the pandemic. Hunt could have chosen to tax profiteers. He chose not to. And the Labour Party have made a choice. They choose to accept austerity and cuts. We choose differently. We choose to demand the democratic nationalisation of all public services under the democratic control of workers, trade unions and communities who use those services with no compensation for rich cat, fat cat shareholders. We choose, we choose, we choose to demand better wages, an end to poverty, decent pensions, investment and protection for the NHS. We choose to demand a workers' economy, an economy that works for workers, not the rich. We choose to be inspired by young people fighting to save our planet. We choose to be inspired by tenants fighting for decent housing with affordable rents. We choose to be inspired by workers fighting back. We choose to say another society, another economy, another system is possible and we choose to fight for it. Forward comrades, brothers and sisters to a better, brighter, workers' future. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Kaz. And it's just actually over a year ago that that dispute started in Coventry, and it started as well by Socialist Party members in that area going down in this straight away, even before the strikes have started, to give out his local bulletin, that helped in the process of that strike form, a strike committee. Every single day, Socialist Party members did down that dispute picket line and winning over the course of that strike the confidence and support of many of the leaders of those local reps who then joined the Socialist Party as well. And that can be replicated, has been replicated across strikes across the country as well. Now, you may have been noticing recently and experiencing that there's a lot to get angry about. So many issues are in desperate need to fight for and so many in need of a socialist solution. And we only have really just touched on some of them here tonight. But that's why we have a whole weekend of sessions as well, as well as this uh, rally uh, this evening. And it's also why our final speaker of this rally tonight is to here to bring together those many issues, themes and topics and spell out what the Socialist Party has to say and what we are fighting for and what sort of party we are building. The General Secretary of the Socialist Party, Hannah Sell, is our next speaker. Comrades, I'm sure that in this room tonight, even before you heard the fantastic speeches that we've already had, there is not a single person who needs convincing that capitalism isn't working. Because it's so clear. It's so clear when the bosses of the Britain, Britain's biggest 100 companies, the FTSE 100 companies, 
Their profits increased by 23% this year to an average, the CEO's pay rather, to an average of 3.9 million. And yet, we're at the start of the longest recession since the 1930s, and we've been told that real incomes are going to fall by 7%, the biggest fall in 200 years. And when even a Tory cabinet minister anonymously told the papers that ordinary voters are stuffed as a result of Thursday's autumn statement. Of course, the energy companies aren't stuffed. When that autumn statement came out, their shares soared because the windfall tax that they were supposedly having imposed on them is so absolutely puny. And I'm sure when you look at what's taking place around the world, you can see capitalism isn't working. Climate change, meaning that a third of Pakistan has been underwater this year, creating tremendous suffering for the working masses, including the members of the Committee for Workers International. 1.2 billion people are due to have to leave their homes as a result of climate change by 2050. And what's the solution of the world's capitalist leaders? To come together at COP27 and wring their hands, reluctantly joined by Sunak, who didn't even want to do the hand-wringing. The real character of COP27 is summed up by the more than 600 oil and gas companies that went, who this year were officially part of the agenda. You had to listen to their greenwashing, not just in the bars and at the banquets, which has always gone on, but on the official programme. We should be clear, in the Socialist Party, we do not suggest that the whole of the world's capitalist elites are oblivious to the problem of climate change. After all, their interests, their profits, are at stake as well as our lives and livelihoods. For some of them, a green transition is actually a nice little profit-making opportunity. And even others can be forced to take some action under mass pressure. But their system, capitalism, is incapable of taking the steps that are really needed. It is chaotic, it is unplanned, it is based on private ownership and the drive for profit. And in addition, it is built on competing nation states. The World Trade Organization this year put out this worthy sounding statement about COP27 and climate change. They said, tackling this crisis is an inescapably global issue requiring urgent and bold leadership. Despite forces is threatening to pull apart our world community, we simply cannot fragment, decouple our economies and create separate trade blocks. We must join forces. Now, look, of course, to the billions of people around the world for whom WTO rules have always meant super exploitation, that will automatically have sounded hollow. But especially today, who are they kidding? Yes, we need global cooperation, but we live in a world of growing capitalist conflict, where increasingly the major capitalist powers are in a dogfight for profits and for market share. And no amount of pleading from the WTO will prevent increased global co competition, fragmentation, and even war as we are seeing in Ukraine. Of course, it's true that we also have seen in the last couple of weeks a meeting between Biden and Xi, so the leaders of the world's first and second powers, and that is an indication that they don't want things to escalate too far. They have no interest in global war, which given modern weaponry could wipe out the capitalist elites along with the rest of humanity. And they also understand any move in that direction would trigger mass movements that would threaten their rule. But increased economic conflict and proxy wars are a different thing. They know their economic fighting will deepen the world recession. And they know that global cooperation is necessary to halt climate change. But capitalism compels them to go down this road. Compels the US as a declining world power, still the biggest, to try and block the rise of China. So that what governs their approach on every issue, for example, the production of solar panels, China's the biggest producer in the world, 
When the US is negotiating with them and introducing tariffs, it's not about human rights, it's not about climate change, it's about maximising the profits of US industry. We live in a world of global capitalist crisis. The era of ever-increasing globalisation is over. Of course, that was globalisation in the interests of the capitalist elites, based on the super-exploitation of the world's working class and poor. But it has been replaced by a multipolar world of increasing economic crisis, conflict and war. The kind of global cooperation that is needed to limit and reverse global warming is ruled out on a capitalist basis. But that doesn't mean it isn't possible. Peter tonight has already quoted the boss's journal, the Financial Times. I'm going to quote it again. This is an article they wrote last year. They said, it is far too risky to rely on the market to act decisively to halt global warming. Instead, central planning is needed to formulate plans for energy, transport, building, industry and agriculture. What possible conclusion can you draw from that other than to save the planet we need socialism, a world democratic socialist plan of production? So, when even the capitalists' own commentators know their system doesn't work, and we, along with the rest of our class, are suffering every day because capitalism doesn't work, I'm sure there is agreement about the crisis of this system. But can a socialist alternative be achieved? What force is capable of it? Not the Westminster politicians. Starmer's new Labour has wiped the slate clean of Corbyn's left policies, and he is constantly singing exactly the same theme as Sunak about fiscal responsibility. Newsnight last night actually had an item where they tried to work out what the difference between the Tory and Labour approach was on the question of the autumn statement, and they couldn't because there is no difference between them. And let's be clear, under Blair, new Labour stuck to Tory spending plans. But that was at a time in 1997 when the economy grew by 4.9%. The next new Labour government will be sticking by Tory spending plans and that will mean vicious austerity and attacks on the working class because we are in an era of capitalist crisis. So Starmer's new Labour will represent the interests of big business. They will not lift a finger to fight for the interests of the working class, never mind socialism. But as I think every speaker has shown at this rally tonight, in 2022, in Britain, for the first time in over a decade, a new generation has begun to see a force that could win, that will win socialist change. The working class is back and rising off its knees. Half a million days of strike action lost in July and August alone. Some, like the Amazon workers, have never been organised before and are starting to take action. Others, like the RMT, battled for six months and successfully reballoted with increased support for action. Or the CWU, who set dates to escalate in the face of vicious management bullying. But we've also seen those who in the past we would have thought of as middle class, adopting the weapon of the strike. The barristers have been out on strike. Look at the Royal College of Nursing. Historically, that was a professional association. The TUC actually once called it an organisation of voluntary snobs because of the reactionary approach of its then leadership. It only put the right to strike in its constitution in 1995. And now, as Holly has already explained, they are preparing to take action. Long ago, Karl Marx explained that conditions determine consciousness. It's not a simple mechanical thing. Human thought is conservative. It lags behind reality and then it catches up with a jump. But the nurses who have been through a pandemic, are working in an NHS in a state of collapse, have suffered a 20% pay cut and been rewarded with claps. Now, like the postal workers, the rail workers, the education workers, dockers and more, are standing up and saying enough is enough. And the autumn statement has only intensified that mood. So it is, <laughs> it is clear that this 
growing movement could force out this weak and divided government. Our class can win at victory. If we all strike together, we coordinate the strikes, we build towards a 24-hour general strike. Plus, of course, fight for the development of mass strike funds in order to ensure that those workers in the front line cannot be starved back to work. The movement is on the ascendancy. The Tories have responded by trying to frighten the workers' movement, and Jared has already referred to this, with new anti-union laws in the first place against the rail workers. In our view, they're making a mistake. This is not 2016 when strikes were on at a very low level. They are taking on a movement that is rising up and can defeat those threatened new laws. Take the example of Ontario in Canada. Last month, the state government introduced legislation to ban strike action by the Union of Public Employees. The response to the right to strike being withdrawn was 55,000 members of that union walking out on a now illegal strike on Friday the 4th of November. Tra <laughs> trade unions across the public and the private sector threatened to join them in a general strike. On Monday morning, the government rescinded that legislation. We can do the same here. Of course, that is not to suggest that we can expect straight lines, a constant row of victories ahead. We've seen striking herds works. We've just heard from Cass how striking works. But let's be clear, it's not an uncomplicated situation. Worker struggle is on the rise, but we're still at an early stage, and it's come after over a decade of retreat in which many even left trade union leaders lost confidence in the capacity of the working class to fight. So it is sometimes, even often the case, that a new generation who are entering the battlefield are doing it without much backup and are discovering that they've got to rebuild the unions in their workplaces, get elected as reps, and to work to rebuild from the ground up. The Socialist Party, as you've heard tonight, we have complete confidence in the capacity of the working class to fight and to win. And our members in the trade unions are amongst the most determined militant fighters in the workers' movement. And we have a very important role to play. Yes, in supporting every worker's struggle. Yes, in going to the picket lines and building the movement. But also in developing a new generation of workplace reps. Of helping them to band together, to build democratic left organisations that can fight to transform the whole trade union movement into a fighting democratic militant body. We don't just take that approach in the unions, we take a similar approach among young people, with socialist student societies up and down the country spearheading the battle about the cost of living crisis on the campuses. And of course, as has already been explained, we have a vital role to play in campaigning for the workers' movement to develop its own political voice, its own party. And we get told it's utopian, it'll never happen, you've been going on about it for years, it's not going to work. That's what our great-grandparents were told when they first began to say we will no longer accept having a choice between the Tories and the Liberals, two capitalist parties, and we have to start to build our own voice. And let's be clear, much as the establishment deride the idea, actually it terrifies them. That's the truth of it. Jeremy Corbyn is now one isolated backbencher with no chance of standing as a Labour candidate in the next election. But he still scares them so much that his name is constantly on the lips of the establishment. He had a good line, Jeremy, when he said that he was living rent-free in Sunak's head, because Sunak never shuts up about Jeremy Corbyn. Now look, it's not Jeremy Corbyn, the very nice man himself, who terrifies them. It's the enthusiasm that his programme generated, a programme that chimed with the demands of millions of workers starting to fight in Britain today. Nationalisation of mail, rail, energy, water and telecoms, just to give one example. If there was a handful of MPs alongside Corbyn fighting for that programme at the moment, they would play an important role in giving confidence to the strikes which in turn would accelerate the building of a new mass party of the working class. And that could have been the case already. 
The left MPs that remain are being constantly intimidated and bullied by the Starmer machine. But honestly, they should stop bowing down. When we, as the militant, were faced with expulsion from the Labour Party for leading the struggle in Liverpool, for the 18 million strong anti-poll tax movement, we didn't hesitate. Class struggle becomes before keeping your party membership card. Unfortunately, up till now, the Labour lefts have not taken the same approach. I just want to give you one example to give you an idea how concretely, if they'd shown some leadership, we would already be in a different situation. Six months ago, at the start of the Ukraine war, 11 Labour MPs signed a Stop the War statement. In our view, it was a weak statement, but it did at least criticise US and British imperialism and NATO, and made clear that they were not fighting, they were not interested in the rights of the Ukrainian masses, but only in their own imperialist interests. Starmer said to those left Labour MPs, take your names off that statement or we're kicking you out. You'll, no longer, you'll join Jeremy Corbyn, you'll no longer be Labour MPs. Every single one of them took their names off in a matter of hours. John McDonnell went further and justified that by saying people are dying on the streets of Ukrainian cities. This is not the time to be distracted by political arguments here. Now is the time to unite. Let's be clear. The worst thing that the workers' movement can do for the working class of Ukraine or Russia or Britain is to unite behind, which means unfortunately support, our capitalist class, the same capitalist class who've made fat profits, acting as the London laundromat, laundromat for cleaning the oligarchs' looted cash. <laughs> Imagine if they'd stood firm. There will be 12 MPs in Parliament fighting on issues relating to the war, saying, for example, why don't you actually let refugees in that are fly, fleeing from war, from Ukraine, but also from Yemen, Somalia and elsewhere, taking the rhetorical remarks about, from Tory politicians about taking the mansions of the Russian oligarchs and saying, yes, take them, but take the empty mansions of all of the billionaires and use them to house the refugees, the homeless and those who need it. they wouldn't have left it at that. Of course they'd gone to the strikers' picket lines, and the left MPs have done that, generally speaking, but they could have also moved motions in Parliament for nationalisation of Royal Mail, the energy companies and the railways. We know they wouldn't have passed, but it would appear to pressure on some other Labour MPs, and it also would have raised the confidence of workers on strike that an alternative was possible. And I tell you what, it would have created an unstoppable mood in the ranks of the trade union movement. Let's stop funding new Labour politicians. Let's start funding these people who are actually fighting for us. Yeah. Unfortunately, that opportunity was missed. There will be others that we hope are taken, as we hope that Corbyn stands in the general election and do other Labour lefts who are forced out of the Labour Party. But regardless of what they do, and most importantly, we are fighting for the industrial fight back to also be reflected at the ballot box. For trade unionists to stand in the coming general election as well as the next local election. If other forces don't step into the breach, then we, as part of the trade unionist and socialist coalition, will fight for that to take place. Campaign for at least 100 trade unionists and anti-austerity activists to take the fight to the ballot box. That would enable us to have a broadcast putting forward policies in defence of the working class, hearing strikers who are standing in that election. Because look, you can never predict the outcome of any general election with absolute certainty. But you have to say, given the acute crisis in Britain today, the ongoing disintegration collapse of the Tory party, Starmer, despite his complete uselessness, is most likely to form the next government. Workers will vote Labour, not out of enthusiasm for his policies, but because it's a means to get rid of the hated Tory government. Any hopes they have, and there will be hopes, especially on the basis of Labour winning election, they will be shattered by the experience of new Labour's pro-capitalist policies 
in office. And therefore, the working class beginning to build a new party is a central preparation for the class struggles which will not end, this is the first round, but will accelerate under the next government. The Socialist Party fights for every possible step forward for the working class. But at each stage, we link that to the need for the socialist transformation of society. We do not accept the diktats of the markets. Trush trashed the markets with her unfunded tax the rich proposal. And that, of course, has been used not mainly to attack Truss wanting to have tax cuts for the rich, but to attack Jeremy Corbyn, surprise, uh, and to say that there's no choice but to implement austerity. You could never have an anti-austerity programme because the markets won't accept it. Who are these markets? They're not independent arbiters of sensible financial policies. They're the bond vigilantes, the super wealthy financial speculators interested only in their own profits. And if they judge, as they do, that working class people cannot even have the guarantee of being well fed, warm, having a secure roof over our heads, then we say, take power out of their hands. <laughs> Nationalise the banks and the finance companies, the major corporations under democratic workers' control and management. That would lay the basis to begin to build a democratic socialist plan of production harness the enormous wealth that exists in this society to build an economy, a society that could meet the needs of all and protect our planet. In the times of intense class struggle we are living through, many more will start drawing socialist conclusions. I would give a quote from the great Russian revolutionary, Leon Trotsky, writing about Britain in 1912. He said, in Britain, where the working masses have for long dragged along at the tail of the capitalist parties. An acute sharpening of the class struggle is now taking place. Colossal strikes of seamen, railwaymen, textile workers and miners have over the past years shake, year, shaken the whole economic life of the country. And at every stage, the question is being posed point blank. Who should own and dispose of the means of production? A clique of exploiters? or all society as a whole, organised in a fraternal, productive and consumer alliance. The British working masses, in the process of these titanic conflicts, are being fed with a revolutionary spirit and the ideas of socialism are making huge gains among them. Strikes in Britain are not yet at the level of the great unrest, as that period was called, but we're heading that way. And today as well, wider layers are starting to ask, who keeps society running? Is it the markets, the bond vigilantes, the CEOs, or is it us? Is it ordinary working class people? And once you draw that conclusion, the next step is, couldn't we run it better without them? Couldn't we overnight ensure that nobody was cold or hungry or homeless? That everybody had the necessities of a decent life? Once you draw that conclusion, the next step is to start discussing how it could be achieved. We've already glimpsed the potential huge power of the working class in the strikes that are taking place. If those strikes were coordinated, Jay would show that strength more clearly, above all, to the people participating in them. In Britain, a one-day general strike would terrify the capitalist class, as it has the Ontarian capitalist class, even with the threat of one. But of course, it would not in itself end capitalism. We've seen that in Sri Lanka, a magnificent movement, the biggest general strike since 1980. But because it hasn't yet been able to put power in the hands of a workers' government, the elites continue to run the show. The same could be said of the wonderful movement in Iran. What is needed to end rotten capitalist rule? Of course, an all-out general strike, we've had one of those in Britain, would go much further than a protest strike 24 hours. It would pose the question point blank of who is running society. Is it the working class or is it the capitalists? But actually, that's why that's not a slogan, a demand that we raise lightly now when the movement is still at an early stage. Such a strike would bring society to a, to a halt, but to take the next step to win 
The working class has to be able to answer. It has to have the confidence, the cohesion, a party that can answer that question clearly. We are going to run society and build a new socialist order. We're not yet at that stage in Britain, but it will come. We are at the start of an era of capitalist crisis and more importantly, struggles on a scale that will dwarf what even the oldest comrades in the room have experienced before. Capitalism offers a miserable future, but we are optimists. The working class, the billions of people who keep society running, who make the capitalist profits, they, we, are beginning to rise off our knees and will be capable of ending capitalism and building a new democratic socialist world. The Socialist Party and the CWI is determined to begin to build a mass party equal to that task. If you agree, join us in that struggle. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you to all our great speakers this evening. Thank you to all the chairs that are chairing a over the course of the weekend, the stewards that have lined and helped out tonight and throughout the week, the tech team who have made sure this is being broadcast live over YouTube and Facebook, and for those, all of you attending this evening over the course of the we weekend and those tuning uh, in. <clears throat> it ends really just the first day of socialism uh, 2022 and if you don't have to shoot off it's going to continue on a more casual basis over the road at Draper's Bar after this rally and don't worry there'll be stewards uh, guiding people uh, over there but more important is tomorrow's sessions that continue from 11am back over at the graduate uh, building 20 different sessions over the course uh, of the day so, you, so if you just tuned in tonight and caught this live uh, stream, or at the moment just have a day ticket or just a rally uh, ticket, don't worry. You can upgrade by turning up again tomorrow morning and uh, upgrading uh, your ticket. And if you're watching online, you can still buy a ticket to tune in on Zoom or still come in on person if you check out socialistparty.org.uk. The event's taking place at Queen Mary's University, the graduate building, uh, here uh, in, in London. <clears throat> but most important of all is that I hope that we have given anyone new to socialist ideas or along to this event for the first time a chance to see what the Socialist Party is all about. But in reality, and maybe unfortunately, but also fortunately, it's really just a glimpse. And I think our speakers will be the first to point out that they are just a snippet of the countless working class leaders, organisers and fighters for socialism that make up the ranks of the Socialist Party. We're a, par we're a party of ordinary people organising and fighting together which in numbers have achieved and can achieve even more extraordinary things for working class people across the world. But we want and we need more people to join us as well. And now has never been a better time to join. So if it's your first time and you haven't already, we'd, I'd urge you to fill in the pink form you would have been given on your way in and check out our website, socialistparty.org.uk if you're watching online, if you are interested in joining those ranks and being a fellow fighter alongside us. Come along as well if you're here tomorrow to the special meeting at lunchtime in the Peston Room if you can uh, as well. Because we need more people like you. We need the energy, the enthusiasm and skills you have to join us and help us be a part of the fight to change the world. Because us, like in the Socialist Party, we're like no others. We're the most realistic. But as like Hannah said, 
we're the most also the most optimistic about where society can change and where it can go. Realistic about the devastating position the working class finds itself in, which in, no, in, which in reality is no different to the position the working class found itself in in the 1800s, which was vividly described harrowingly by Frederick Engels in his harrowing book, The Conditions of the Working Class in England, where he talked about the streets of homeless people unable to find a bed uh, each evening, where he talked about, where he raised the question, what is to become of the destituted millions who consume today what they earn yesterday, who have created the greatness of, Eng the greatness of England by their inventions and their toil? It's what led him, alongside Marx, to the, the realisation that it was the working class that was the most powerful force in society. But we're also, as I said, the most optimistic of the possibilities and the opportunities for the workers' class to fight back and take up the ideas of socialism in the process. Others turn their back on the working class, especially here in Britain. You know, Leon Trotsky, and Hannah pointed it, uh, towards it in a, a quote uh, just there, in some of his writings on Britain, often makes the point that the working class in Britain is the oldest in the world. Its institutions and the trade unions, and often in its consciousness, can sometimes be slow to respond and catch up with the events. Engels called them unexcelled, uh, unexcelled, unexcelled schools of war. But once it gets going, it has within it the momentous forces capable of revolutionary events. And in nine days in 1926, it demonstrated that. And in the last few months and in the last a year, the events and the, the strikes that have taken place have given just a tiny glimpse of those possibilities uh, as well. A future of more barbaric wars, ever-increasing poverty, deprivation and climate catastrophe, or a struggle for socialist change. That is the choice facing the working class globally. Our lives, our future, aren't safe under capitalism. So join the Socialist Party. Build the Socialist Party if, you are, if you're already a member and fight to do something about it and help establish a socialist future for the working class across the world. <laughs> now to bring this rally to an end, you may have noticed also on the reverse side of the join leaflet, there's a bit of a story about a song called the Internationale. Now, if it's your first time, this, what, what, what takes place next might seem a little bit strange. But hey, we're socialists. A lot of people call us strange. And as Leon Trotsky once said, only dead fishes swim with the stream. But in the same way, like over the course of the next month, when working class people get together at football matches, for parties, weddings, funerals, at protests, march. They like to have a little sing-along, a dance. Don't worry, there's going to be no dancing this evening. But it's a tradition of the socialist movement that goes back to the Paris Commune. Even Lenin commented on the role the Internationale plays in linking workers across uh, the world. So while it might seem a little bit strange and weird, sing it with pride. You don't have to sing, and don't worry, you don't have to listen to my peculiar commentary accent to lead the way. But as the, the, the leaflet often points out, even Stalin got rid of the Internationale because it brought back the memory of the Russian Revolution and the role the working class and workers' democracy played uh, in that. So as I said, you don't have to listen to me lead the way. And if I can be joined by the Welsh choir to lead the way, <laughs> we'll get this show on the road. Arise, ye starvelings, from your slumbers. Arise, ye criminals of want. For reason in revolt now thunders, and alas, ends the age of Kant. Away with all your superstitions, Servile masses, arise, arise. We'll change for 
forth with the old conditions, burn the dust to win the prize. So comrades, come rally on the last fight, let us face the international unites the human race. So comrades, come rally on the last fight, let us face the international unites the human race. Tony, Tony, Tony! Tony, Tony, Tony! 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 Tony, Tony, Tony!